Hey, we're so glad you are tuning in to participate in worship with us here at Redeemer in Waco. We often say things like the gospel is everything to us or Jesus is everything to us. And we say those kinds of things and believe those things because the Bible is all about Jesus. The Bible is all about this great God who made all things, who made you, who loves you and who loved you so that he sent his son for you to live, die, and rise from the dead for you. And so we, we hope and we pray that as you participate in worship uh, in this way, that you'd be encouraged, that uh, God's word would be clear to your mind, that it would land maybe more real than ever on your heart and in the depth of your being, that God would speak to you, that you would experience him, you would connect with him as he speaks to you in his word, and that you would have your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ by faith. Um, so, so we're so glad you're participating in worship uh, with us. Before we head into worship, uh, I just want to make a, another quick note and just and really kind of a, a reminder, but also a bit of an update on all things regarding the coronavirus. We are continuing to monitor the coronavirus daily and weekly uh, in our county here in McLennan County, as well as across the nation and what, what's going on, what seems to be going on, as you know, um, and are certainly probably frustrated and exhausted by things seem to change daily, especially weekly. We're monitoring all of it. Uh, we are meeting in person on Sundays at 10 a.m. And uh, if you haven't been yet, I want to encourage you that um, if it's wise for you to come, to come, to meet in person with us, to worship together at 10 a.m. on Sundays. In our sanctuary, we have space seating, all of our seating. It's groups of chairs separated by six feet. On our website, you can actually see the basic layout. Um, at the bottom of our website, there's a link to see what our seating actually looks like to kind of prepare you for it, but it's all space. We have tons of room in our new lobby and throughout our building. So it's not a crammed environment or atmosphere. You're not having to rub shoulders with people. Um, you can stay distance. We require masks the whole time while in our building during our services. We've got masks at the front door. We've got hand sanitizer throughout our building. We're sanitizing and cleaning our building and doing what we can to uh, reduce risk and, and risk and stay stay safe. And so we want to encourage you to come if it's wise for you to come and, um, and, and relatively safe for you to come to be with us and worship with us. And I, I want to make a quick note for those of you with kids. I know that our Redeemer kids child care has been on hold and on pause. Um, we're in the throes of planning for the best uh, while preparing for multiple um, situations and outcomes come in the fall, but we're planning for the best. We have plans right now uh, that we're working on to figure out child care uh, for the fall. For those of you who would, who would love to utilize it, to be able to come to church and let your kids uh, be taken care of while you worship with us. Um, and so we're in the throes of working hard on that. Uh, we're going to begin putting out more content and resources for you parents to be able to disciple your kids at home and teach them about Jesus at home. And so stay tuned for that. If you've got uh, little ones uh, here at Redeemer, make sure you're a part of the Redeemer Kids Facebook page um, as, as there will be more content coming out uh, on Facebook. And also subscribe to our newsletter. We'll be putting it on our newsletter and social media as well. Also, uh, right now we have rooms, maybe five or six rooms that all have the audio of our whole service. And so if you want to bring your kids, but they're, maybe they're a little too rowdy for the service, um, you can take them in one of those rooms, let them play with a bunch of toys, and then listen and participate in worship the whole time. We have a big overflow room as well uh, that uh, has the audio and video of the whole service. And so you can let your kids kind of run around in there, be a bit more loud. Um, and, and be able to participate. But also just know this, parents of, of little ones, it's okay to bring them in the service and if they're a bit loud, um, uh, louder than maybe you're comfortable with, we're okay with it. We get it, we welcome it. Feel free to sit in the back and let them be a little bit more rowdy. It's okay if they're climbing on chairs and, and things like that. We get it. These are weird, unusual days, and we're totally ready and prepared we, for that. We want you to be a part of worship if you can be. Lastly, we're frustrated with you if you are a part of the at-risk population and you want to be in church and kids aren't holding you back, but you just don't feel that it's uh, safe enough um, or the risk is low enough for you to be here. It just doesn't seem wise for you 
we get it. We respect your decision. We encourage you, um, if you're in that at-risk population, that if it doesn't seem wise for you to be here in person, uh, then don't come. And that's why we're putting out these videos and this content for, for you to be able to participate in worship with us. And so we're frustrated with you. Uh, we're exhausted with you. And, uh, and we want to help continue to help you connect uh, with us. And so please reach out. Let us know what we can do to serve you and keep you connected. Um, and again, subscribe to our newsletter, follow us on social media, reach out to the church, email us to figure out what's going on. Because like I said, things change daily and weekly. And so we're trying to communicate as much as we can to keep you in the loop, especially if you're not able to be here in person. So uh, we're with you. We love you. We're praying for you. And uh, we know that, that, that we'll see this through and we'll get back to normal at some point. Um, but, uh, but again, we're glad you're tuning in to participate in worship. Let's, let's head into worship. Let's hear this call to worship based on Luke 24. We're going to sing of the resurrection of Christ in a minute. And so let's proclaim the resurrection of Christ after Jesus rose from the dead while his disciples and his followers believed that he was still dead. Some women uh, went to his tomb uh, believing he was still there, believing he was still dead, and they were met by these men, these angels, and this is what they were, this is what they were told, and, and, and let's proclaim his resurrection from Luke 24. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Wherever you're at, if you're comfortable and able, you can say with me, the Lord has risen indeed. Let's sing together.
through what's called the Heidelberg Catechism, and, and you can Google the Heidelberg Catechism and pull that up. What is that? It was a document written a couple hundred years ago, a question and answer format, working through different theological um, ideas and, and, and really trying to make clear what we see in the scriptures and what we believe the Bible says. And we're looking at Christ's ascension. He died, he rose from the dead, as we just sang, and then he ascended into heaven. Why should you know about the ascension of Christ? How does it benefit you? What good is it to know that Jesus ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father today? So here's the question from question 49. How does Christ's ascension to heaven benefit us? And again, you can say this together if you want with me. First, he's our advocate in the presence of his Father. Second, we have our own flesh, our own humanity in heaven as a pledge that Christ will take us up to himself. And third, and lastly, he sends his spirit to us as a corresponding pledge. So we seek not earthly things, but the things above, where Christ is sitting at God's right hand. All right, let's sing. Lord, I come. back into our service, a normal part of our service of confession of sin and hearing the hope of the gospel. And this morning, or whenever you're tuning in, we want to confess together um, the ways that we fail to love people. The summary of the law is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so we want to take time to confess how we fail to love God and, and fail to love each other, our spouses, our friends, our family, our kids, our community, those around us. So let's hear this from Galatians 5. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. And so we can confess together, Lord, forgive us for our unbelief. 
and for not loving you with everything in us, nor our neighbor as ourselves. Oh Lord, we need you. Feel free to pause this video and take a moment, 30 seconds, a minute to confess sin uh, together. All right, amen. Let's hear this hope of the gospel from Galatians chapter 2. A person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. And so we say together, Jesus, you are our one defense and righteousness. Let's take time to uh, pray together. Let's pray for God to be at work here at Redeemer and in our church and through us in our city in Waco and beyond. Let's pray that God would be at work um, saving people by the power of his gospel, uh, that Jesus would show up in the lives of people through, through people like you and me, sharing the gospel with people in our, our city. So let's pray. Let's pray for our friends, family, people that come to mind. Pray as we pray together um, uh, for, for people who may be um, suffering, uh, under the, the weights and difficulties and pains of life, which we're going to talk about in, in our sermon today, uh, pray. Pray for them. Pray for your friends. Pray for those you've heard of. Pray for our, our city, our state, our country, and even the world. Let's pray together. God, we come to you as those uh, adopted by you, made sons and daughters, not because of our works, because a person is not justified and accepted by you because of works, but because of Jesus and his work, his life, his death, his resurrection. So we come in faith to you uh, based on Jesus, trusting Jesus, uh, and we ask that you would work. We ask that you would be at work and you would continue to work in our lives, in our hearts, in our church. You'd continue to work through us in our community, our neighborhoods, those around us. You would be at work for your glory and kingdom in our state, in our country, and even the whole world. God, we pray your kingdom would come. We pray your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, we pause for a moment uh, to pray for people that come to mind, friends, family members, whoever it might be, who need prayer. They need you. And so we pray now. God, we ask that you would reveal yourself in immense grace, immense mercy, immense kindness, immense power more and more to us, to our hearts, to our friends, to our family, to those you put around us uh, to, to preach the gospel to, to communicate the gospel to, to introduce people to you, uh, that more and more people would know you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you would, turn with me in your Bible or on your phone, wherever, to Hebrews chapter 12. We, for the past two weeks, have been looking at what does it mean to be adopted by God? What does it mean to be sons and daughters of God? That language is littered throughout the New Testament, that we are sons and daughters of God through faith in Jesus. And through our faith in Jesus together, we're brother, brothers and sisters. We're this family of God. And so we've been looking at that, and we're going to kind of wrap that up this morning. We haven't said all we could say, obviously, um, but we're going to be looking at that in Hebrews uh, chapter 12 this morning, verses 1 to uh, verses 1 to 13. If you might remember, I don't know if this show is still going on. I wasn't uh, an avid watcher or a watcher at all. Jenny Jones, the Jenny Jones show. Uh, Jenny Jones show used to have a, a segment or a particular show called Boot Camp My Preteen. Boot Camp My Preteen is all about preteens, like 10 year olds who are already getting into a lot of trouble. And uh, so they had this show to try to basically scare them back on the right path, kind of shock their system, get them on the right path keep them out of future trouble, keep them out of prison, that sort of thing. And on this particular, this clip is on YouTube. I watched this years and years ago. Um, it'll make you cry if you watch it on YouTube. On this particular episode, you've got this 10-year-old boy, cute little 10-year-old boy who I guess has been getting into a lot of trouble. And they've got this like drill sergeant, uh, military guy decked out in camo, and, uh, and they're trying to get him on the right path, right? Kind of like scare him onto the right path. And this drill instructor's in his face, and the boy's mom is standing off to the side. And he asks the little boy, do you love that woman right there? Do you love that woman right there? You love her, right? Kind of like, you love her, right? So if you love her, start acting right. And the little boy says, yes, sir. Yes, sir. He says, now you're not an adult until you're 18. 
And then he says, do you want me to be your daddy for the next eight years? And he's totally expecting the boy to, of course, say, no way, right? Like, I don't want a drill sergeant military guy to be my daddy. You're scary. You're authoritative. You're going to discipline me. Like, I don't want anything to do with you being my daddy for the next eight years, you know? Um, So he says, you want me to be your daddy for the next eight years, huh? And the little boy says, yes, sir. And the whole crowd goes, oh. No one was expecting it. The drill sergeant, the, the, the drill sergeant kind of stands up. He's totally taken off guard, doesn't expect the boy to have said that, was totally expecting him to say, no, of course not. He kind of smiles and looks at the crowd. He doesn't exactly know what to do. The whole script that he had played out in his mind just got blown up by this little boy saying, yeah, I want you to be my daddy for the next eight years. So the drill sergeant's taken off guard and he says, why do you want me to be your daddy? The tones kind of change. The directions kind of change. Why do you want me to be your daddy? And the, and the boy The boy says, because I have no daddy. And now everything's changed. No one expected this. And uh, if you watch the clip, the the drill drill sergeant um, is just broken by it. And it's real fuzzy, but, but it looks like he basically just starts to cry. He gives the boy a hug, and then he takes the boy off stage. It's like shows over something else is going on here than we planned or realized. Because this boy just said, yeah, I want you to be my daddy because I don't have a daddy. Um, The boy knew best. The boy knew better than the drill sergeant. The boy knew better than the producers of the show. The boy knew better than everyone in the audience. The boy knew best exactly what he needed. And it wasn't just this shock to his system to get him on the right path. It was a good daddy. It was a good dad to raise him, to love him. The boy knew best that he needed a dad to love him and care for him and to be committed to him and even discipline him. I mean, he's looking at this this drill sergeant who's just in his face, who's an authority, who's tough, who's big, who's kind of scary, who's trying to discipline him. And he says, the boy goes, yeah, I actually need this. Yeah, I actually would like this because I don't have a dad at all. So you want to be my daddy? (laughs) He knew better than everyone exactly what he needed, a dad to love him, to be committed to him, and even discipline him, even discipline him. And Hebrews 12 shows us that that is exactly what we have in God, a God who loves us so much, a father who is so great in his love for you, he's even willing to discipline us. So we're going to read from Hebrews chapter 12 together, verse 1 to 13. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? Quote, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Verse 7, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you're left without discipline in which all have participated, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we've had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. Pray with me. God, we pray that you'd speak to us in your word. You'd continue to speak to us in your word. You'd reveal how great you are as our loving father this morning. I pray that you would reveal how wonderful you are as our father in our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Life is painful, is it not? Life is hard. And we just read in Hebrews 12 a number of things that, that start to kind of indicate that, right? You, you read of things like weight and sin and struggle and discipline and pain. Whatever your theology is, whatever you believe, and I mean whatever, Christian, 
atheist, agnostic, Muslim, Mormon, whatever it is you believe, you know life is hard. You know that life is painful and full of pain and difficulty and suffering. You you know that, and the Bible knows that, and Hebrews know that. Hebrews knows that. In fact, in Hebrews 11, uh, the author just finished leading into what we just read this long list of believers who have gone before us. Guys like Abraham, guys like Moses. This long list of people who've gone through wildly difficult things, and they maintained their faith, and they kept their faith, and they held on to to their faith throughout all of it. And then, and then the author summarizes it right before chapter 12, what we just read, saying, I don't have time to tell you about all the others, guys like David and Samson and others, um, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the sword, were tortured in prison, put to death by stoning, sawed in two, were destitute, persecuted, and mistreated, and on he goes. Life is hard. Life is full of uh, pain. So here's my question. As believers who've been adopted by God, who have this incredible father, right? You, if you believe in Jesus, you've been adopted by God. You're his son or his daughter. He loves you. We've been looking at that for the past two weeks, his amazing love for us, his amazing care for us. And if that's true, then what in the world is going on in the difficulties and pains of your life? Like when life hurts, what is going on? What is God up to? Why is God uh, allowing it? Why does life still hurt so bad, even as adopted sons and daughters? This is what Hebrews 12 is answering. This is what Hebrews 12 is answering. Look at verse 1. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You may know this passage or this picture. You maybe heard it before. It's this picture of of life as a race, the Christian life as a, as a race with a finish line. And just like those before us in Hebrews 11, uh, we are to run and we're going to face difficulties and pains and hardships and we're to run and endure and, and not grow weary and not grow tired and not give up, but hold fast our faith. And we're to get rid of hindrances, right? Just as an athlete, like if you're running a hundred yard dash, you don't want to do it with a chain attached to you. You don't want to do it with a, a 40 pound kettlebell uh, uh, holding on to you. You want to get rid of weights and hindrances and everything that slows you down and hinders you from running the race. And specifically, the author here talks about weight and sin. As adopted sons and daughters, we are surrounded by weights and sins, sins that cling so closely, sins that you feel are just totally ingrained in the depth of your heart that, it, that it's so hard to get away from and so hard to beat and so hard to kill and, and weights that come from uh, outside of you that, that, that are out of your control that make life so difficult. So simply put, right here, we're talking about the realm, the reality of the Christian life. We're talking about sanctification, living the Christian life by faith, the day-to-day -day life um, of, of believers, specifically matters of struggling with sin and suffering. Sin and, and suffering, things like holiness and righteousness and repentance and suffering and pain and faith, the Christian life. So here's the question, how do we run? How do we run? We've got this race before us. We know there's these weights that we're supposed to throw off, this sin that we're supposed to throw off. How do we do that? How do we run? We get our first major understanding in verse 2. We're to run looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. In other words, we began the Christian life looking to Jesus in faith, not looking to our works, our power, our abilities, our performance, none of that, looking to Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, who he is and what he's done for us. And here Hebrews says, nothing's changed. Continue looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, the author of your faith, the beginning of your faith, the sustenance of your faith, the object of your faith, even today. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him. In other words, don't move away from faith in the Christian life. Move deeper into it. Move deeper into faith. In other words, move deeper into Jesus. Look at Jesus. Continue to look at Jesus. And as we look to Jesus, we actually see the ultimate example of living through the pains of life. Look at the rest of verse 2. Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Could it get more painful and more difficult than the life of Jesus? 
being perfectly righteous and yet opposed and persecuted and then crucified, murdered on a Roman cross, naked, suffocating, bleeding out, mocked, shamed by those around you. Could it get worse? Yes, you could be on that cross bearing the very wrath of God that Jesus was. Bearing God's wrath uh, on that cross. Even if we had no other examples, like in Moses or Abraham or people before us, our very Lord and Savior is this example of living through unbelievable difficulty, pain, and suffering. Tempted in every way to sin as we are tempted, and yet without sin. Never giving in to the temptation. He faced hostility and even resisted, resisted sin, resisted giving up, quitting, bailing on the will of the Father to the point of shedding blood. And Hebrews says that's something you and I haven't done yet. He did it to the point of shedding blood. So Jesus was tempted just as we are, yet resisted temptation. He ran his race all the way to the point of bloodshed. Um, And he did that, as astounding as that is, he did that to adopt you. He did that to make you his brother. He did that fulfilling the father's plan to adopt you as his son or his daughter through faith. But let me ask again, if Jesus has done it, if he's accomplished salvation, he's done the work, why is life still so hard? Why does life seem all too often to hurt, to hurt really bad, to have a lot of pain? To answer that, Hebrews introduces us to this idea of fatherly discipline. Look at verse 5. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard, regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. This is incredible. This is incredible. Hebrews here in chapter 12 is, is looking at just kind of the whole gamut of the Christian life. Whether it's sufferings and struggles that you kind of have no control over maybe. Maybe that come from outside and even your own sin that clings so closely. It's looking at all of that and then relates it, relates the pain of life and the difficulty of life to the Father, God the Father, fathering us, disciplining us. Suddenly, Hebrews takes the pains of life and says these are not just rogue, random difficulties that God has nothing to do with or he's unaware of or maybe he's not in control of. No, 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 they're not, they're not rogue difficulties. They're not random it's actually, the God, it's actually God at work in your life for you, for your good, in love as a loving father. These aren't just rogue, random difficulties. These are tools in the hands of God. These are tools. These are, these are actually signs of, his, of your adoption. Far from going, God, life hurts. I must not be adopted by you. I must not be loved by you. I must not be your son or your daughter because life just hurts too bad. No, no, no. These are actually signs, according to Hebrews 12, of your adoption, that God is loving you. And, and yeah, he's loving you in a way that, that kind of hurts right now, but it's good for you. He's loving you. God allows pain and suffering. Our confession, the Westminster Confession of Faith, would actually say that he even allows sin Uh, in order to work in your life in a loving way. Now, we have to understand discipline to not get lost in some harmful ideas. And from the outset, we have to understand that the discipline of the Lord here is not like this specific moment that you know, oh, I know I'm getting disciplined right now, right? Uh, Kind of like like our kids would know, um, I did this and therefore I'm now in timeout or whatever, It's not like that. The picture here is not of, oh, I can trace God's hand in the specific moment of when he disciplined me because I did this. This is a much more general, big picture of a God who is 24-7 committed to you. 24-7 committed to teaching you, instructing you, forming you, shaping you, working in your life. In other words, disciplining you teaching you, forming you, growing you 24-7 in all things, in the good and the bad. In other words, as it says in Romans, God works what? All things for the good of those that love him. He works everything, all things, all things. He's, he's that committed to you. 
he loves you that much. He cares for you that much. And he's father. So, so we're not looking at, oh, wh- when did God discipline me? Wh- when, when, or when's that going to happen? No, no, no. The, the, the more appropriate question would be, when is he not? When is he not loving me and fathering me and caring for me? Romans would say, in all things, in all things, he's working for, he's working for your good. And so this is how we're told to respond, understanding the pains of life in this way, that God is even at work in some way, in some form or fashion. Maybe not directly causing it, maybe allowing it, but then using it. In some form or fashion, God is working all things for your good. He says this, verse 5, My son, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Don't regard it lightly. Um, in other words, don't think that, that life should just be a walk in the park. Don't think that, that, it, that it should just all be easy and painless and there's, there's not going to be any discipline. There's not going to be any difficulty. There's, there's no sin that clings closely that you need to to seek to kill and root out. There's no weights that you need to, to drop and, and get rid of. In other words, taking the discipline of the Lord lightly might look like reading your Bible. I mean, to, to get real practical, and you read something that convicts you of your sin, you just take it lightly. Ah, oh, that's no big deal. You just take it lightly. God's not speaking to me there. God's not at work right there, because that kind of hurts. That, that kind of convicts me. That kind of that kind of cuts me. Or maybe you're going through a pain, a suffering in life, and it's, it's maybe exposing something in you, a weight you need to get rid of, a sin, whatever it might be. And, uh, and you just go, ah, oh, no, I'll just kind of ignore that, just run away from that, numb myself to that. That'd be taking, taking it lightly. In other words, to take lightly God's discipline is to, to, to make God out to be like this absentee father, this father who kind of generally loves you, but he's not involved in the details. He's not committed in the details to you, right? He, he doesn't, he didn't really care about your sin. Like he loves you at a high level. He didn't really care about your sin. He doesn't really care about you running your race with endurance or anything like that. He's just kind of this absentee father. And on the other side of the spectrum, verse five, we shouldn't be weary when reproved by him. We shouldn't take it lightly, but we also shouldn't, shouldn't be weary when reproved by him. In other words, we shouldn't only see the pains and the difficulties of life or the discipline of the father. And that's it. That's it. That's all we see. Like as if there's no end goal to it. There's no bigger picture involved. Like I thought I was adopted by God, but, but I am in an incredibly difficult spot or I'm going through an incredibly difficult thing or there's tons of pain and that's all I see. I thought I was adopted, but I must not be because this hurts. I thought I was adopted, but I still have sin in my life. And if I still have sin, there's no way that God loves me. There's no way that I'm a part of his family. That's all you see. So this idea to be weary is to portray God as to essentially, to put it kind of with this illustration, to only care about the details, to only see your sin. He only sees that small little sin and he's just going after it and he's just punishing you for it. And there's no end goal just punishment. That's all he sees. That's all he knows. And he's just punishing you for it. Right? On the one hand, it's like he's not involved in the details. On the other hand, it's like he can only see that, that little detail or that little sin. And so you grow weary because you don't have a bigger picture of his, of his love. So what's the truth? The truth is verse six, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves. He disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives and accepts. It's for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. What an upside down way for us to think about the difficulties, pains, and sufferings of life. God is loving you. He's at work in his tender, loving care for you. He's working everything for your good, even the things that hurt. And so far from being a sign that he's, that he's absent, far from being a sign, uh, far from being a sign that he's, that he's just punishing you because he's just angry with you. No, it's a sign of his love for you, that he would use incredibly difficult things, that he would even use your own sin and suffering to love you and care for you as a good father. I mean, we know this, right? We know this. We know, we expect fathers to discipline their kids. We expect that. And then in hindsight, we respect it. I mean, I've, I've never heard someone say, man, I wish my dad would not have so lovingly disciplined me growing up. 
it's really messed everything up for me, you know? I mean, we all look in hindsight, and Hebrews even says it. We look in hindsight, we go, man, I'm so glad that even though it hurt in the moment, and I didn't understand it in the moment, I'm so glad my mom and dad disciplined me. I'm so glad I had parents to, to help me and to guide me and to teach me when I just didn't know better, you know, and, and to help me grow up into a responsible adult. We, we expect it from fathers, earthly fathers, and, and we, we greatly respect it from earthly fathers. Um, so we, so this makes sense. This makes sense that this is how God would love us, that he'd be willing to even use pain to teach us, to form us, uh, and to father us. And we often recoil at the idea of discipline because we often think of discipline how we discipline, right? We think of discipline how we discipline, like, like it's just this angry outburst that's super frustrated, you know, and that's discipline. But that's not the picture here at all. That's not the picture here at all. This isn't, this isn't just this response of an angry God at some specific sin in your life. Not at all. This is a This is an ongoing, general, 24-7 commitment, loving commitment to you in all the details of your life. In all the details of uh, of your life to form you, to shape you, to guide you, to lead you, to father you. So what's the end goal? What's the end goal of it? How is it so loving? Why is it so loving that God is willing to discipline us as sons and ours? Look at verse 10. For they, speaking of earthly fathers, disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he, speaking of God, disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. God loves you too much to let the weights of your life crush you, God loves you too much as your father to let the sins of your life crush you. God is in the business of restoring you and healing you and renewing you, fighting for you. Just as the text said, for your good. That's the end goal. That's what he's up to. That's what he's doing. It hurts right now, whatever it might be. He's working for your good. The scriptures promise us that. And notice the context. The context here is, father and sons. So all this talk of holiness and righteousness, that God is forming holiness in you. He's forming righteousness in you. He's changing you. He's renewing you. He's healing you back into the image of God. It's all in the context of a father-son, father-daughter relationship. In other words, just as, just as when you have a good father, you grow up to say, man, I want to be just like my dad. Man, I want to be just like God, my father in holiness and in righteousness. So the goal of earthly discipline is, is this ongoing commitment to shape you and mold you and to not let the weights of your life crush you and the sins of your life crush you. And so God is at work doing that. And so you too lay aside the weight, lay aside the sin. And sometimes he'll allow pain to teach us. Sometimes he will allow pain in our lives to teach us just as good earthly parents do that. And we know, we know that we learn immensely from pain. Uh, Jocko Weilink, um, or Willink, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Jocko Weilink, I think he was the lieutenant commander um, over SEAL, the SEAL Team 3 um, in the Navy. Uh, he, you probably heard of him. He has maybe one of the number one business podcasts in the world right now. He's a he, he moved his, from his military life into business consulting using a lot of the principles he learned in his time in the military in business. And in the military, as a leader, um, he would often respond in an unusual way to difficulties, to suffering, to pain. Um, so he asked this question, how do I deal with setbacks, failures, delays, defeats, and other disasters? He says, I actually have a, a very simple way of dealing with these situations summed up in one word, good. Good. He has a story of a subordinate who would come to him with a major problem. We got this, Jocko, we got this huge problem. Jocko, this thing's going terrible. Jocko, everything's falling apart. And the subordinate of Jocko's got so used to Jocko's answer that I think one day he basically said, I already know what you're going to say. We got this big problem, but I already know what you're going to say. What am I going to say? He said, Jocko, I know you're going to say, good. So Jocko began to explain, this is why my answer is Good, because when things are going bad, 
something good is going to come out of it. So he says, oh, the mission got canceled? Good. We can focus on another one. Didn't get the new high-speed gear we wanted? Good. We can keep it simple. Didn't get promoted in my job? Good. More time to get better. Didn't get the job you wanted? Good. Go out, gain more experience, build a better resume. Got injured? <laughs> Good. Needed a break from training. Got beat? Good. We learned something. He says, if you can say the word good, then guess what? It means you're still alive. And if you're still alive, it means you're still breathing. And if you're still breathing, you've still got some fight left in you. So when bad things come his way, good, we're going to learn something from it. When bad things come, come his way, good, uh, something good is going to come out of this. If you are in Christ, you can face pain and suffering and difficulty, though it may not be something righteous happened to you or something inherently good and godly that happened to you in a overall big picture way you can face it and say good the father's at work good the father's at work somehow in some way i don't understand it i'm even frustrated by it i don't get it but i know i've got a father who loves me and he's at work he's at work loving me he's at work making everything all things work for my good making me holy making me righteous making me like him so look to jesus look to jesus and take heart because you'll never have to go where jesus went you'll never have to go where jesus went because he went there for you jesus went to the place that you and i often fear we're in with pain and suffering he actually went there so that you'll never have to go there jesus went to the place of of the darkness of God's punishing wrath. What you deserve and what I deserve, he went there for you so that you would never have to. The Holy Son, the Holy Righteous Son, Jesus, bore God's punishing, angry, justly, justly angry wrath for your sins so you would never have to. He went to the place of dark wrath so that you could be welcomed home so that you could be welcomed home so that you could be loved in the details of your life in everything that you could be loved that you could have a father that's committed to you in all of the details so that you could have a father that cares for you so much that even in the pain and the difficulty of life even when you feel like you just you can't that sin is clinging so closely god what are you doing i'm fighting this with everything in me but it's just not going away god what are you doing why are you allowing this you can know I have a good, loving, tender father who's here, who's present, who's committed to me in everything, working everything for my good. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we pray that we would know you and see you as we ought to, as we are taught to in Hebrews 12, that you are a, a good father who loves us who cares for us, who's committed to us, who's committed to using the difficulties, pains, sufferings, and sins of life and working all things for our good. And so, Jesus, we look to you. And Jesus, we, we seek to lay aside every weight and every sin that clings so closely as we look to you and as we trust you and as we run the race that you have set before us, knowing you will carry us through. You will do this for us as we rest in you and we, we receive from you. God, may this word of your goodness and grace and love and care be clear to our minds and sink deeper and deeper into our hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's, uh, let's take time and let's sing together.
hear this benediction again from Galatians 4. In Christ, you can raise your hands wherever you're at. In Christ, you are sons, and God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So we say together, we are no longer slaves, but sons and daughters and heirs through God. Amen.